Amen. 42 in your hymnal, number 42, saved by the blood of the crucified one. Let's all stand together as we sing number 42 together on that first. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, now ransomed from sin and a new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, the Father he spake and his will it was done. Great price of my pardon, his own precious son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, glory and shame, glory and shame, my sin. All hail to the Father, all hail to the Son, all hail to the Spirit, the great three in one, saved by the blood of the crucified one, saved, saved. singing tonight aren't you glad you're saved and uh nobody sings like god's people sing and uh you sang like you were saved tonight good to see you in church this evening looking forward to what the lord has for us tonight i uh, appreciate you being back in church on sunday evening let's open with prayer shall we father we bow before you now tonight we thank you lord for the wonderful morning uh, that you gave us this morning thank you lord for uh, john receiving christ as his savior and thank you for uh, the young girl baptized today and obeying you in baptism. And, Lord, for the other decisions that were made here in this place, we're, we're, we're giving you the praise and the glory for it. And, Father, we're back again this evening and ask you to meet with us once again tonight. Lord, we don't just want to go through the motions and say we went to church tonight. We want to leave in a little bit saying God met with us tonight. And I pray that you'd speak to our hearts and may your will be done in each heart and life tonight. Lord, may you be pleased with our service this evening. Bless every aspect of it. For your honor and glory, and it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right, you may be seated.
200, uh, 272, 272. I'm on the winning side. Once I drifted out in sin, had no hope nor joy within. 272 on that first. Once I drifted out in sin, had no hope nor joy within. And my soul was burdened down with pride. Then my Savior came along, and he showed me I was wrong. Now I know I'm on the winning side. Well, I'm on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. Out in sin, no more will I abide. I've enlisted in the fight for the cause of truth and right. Praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. From the straight and narrow way, I was drifting every day. Out upon the water deep and wide. But it all is over now, glory light is on my brow. And my soul is on the winning side. Well, I'm on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. Out in sin, no more will I abide. I've enlisted in the fight for the cause of truth and right. Praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. I will never have a fear, for the Lord is ever near, and in Him so often I confide. He's the keeper of my soul since I gave Him full control, and He placed me on the wind. Well, I'm on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. <coughs> I've enlisted in the fight for the cause of truth and right. Praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. A couple announcements for us now on our regular schedule this week, uh, Wednesday night, of course, for our Bible study right back here in the auditorium and the children's clubs meeting. Uh, be our last lesson in Second Peter chapter three uh, this coming Wednesday evening. And so we look forward to that. Oh, remember, uh, you can still get your picture taken, uh, portrait after the service. Uh, Lindy will be over uh, in the fellowship hall. If you didn't get there this morning, uh, you can get over there this evening and uh, get your picture. Uh, and she'll take care of that right after the service tonight. And then uh, pray for the Morelands. They'll be heading out Wednesday morning. And uh, they'll be gone for the month of March and April both. Uh, they've got, I think, 13 churches I counted on the schedule there that uh, they'll be in over the next two months. Got a full full schedule, uh, heading south to Texas and then uh, all the across uh, the Super Tuesday states. They'll be going straight across to Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and Florida and all of those. Uh, so pray for safety for them and profitable meetings for them. Uh, several missions conferences are mixed in there that they'll be a part of, so uh, pray for their safety and uh, keep them in prayer as they travel, if you would, please. All right, <coughs> and let's see, men's breakfast Saturday morning, 8.15, sign-up sheets down there on the table, uh, sign up for that. We always have a great time at the men's breakfast, uh, that's this coming Saturday at 8.15. Then next Sunday uh, will be our higher ground offering. All right, hope you've been praying for that and asking the Lord what he'd have you do next Sunday over and above your normal gift and uh, that you give and that we can uh, get some of the projects done that uh, need to get done this year uh, and particularly need to get done, some, some of the doors and things need to get done like immediately. Uh, so we're praying that God will meet that need for us next Sunday and I hope you'll be praying and be ready to give on next Sunday for that. Okay, I think that's all I've got right now. We want to take just a moment. We'll welcome any visitors we have with us tonight. Anybody here tonight for the first time? Looking, I don't think I can have any first time. Is it Lavelle? 
you're back tonight. Good to see you here. Thank you for being here this evening. And um, Alana wants her presence to be known, and uh, she is here. The Reeds are here, and uh, Brother Di is here. Good to have them tonight. Here they come. Uh, Josiah and Isaac are going to follow the Lord in baptism tonight. And so they came to, to see that take place. That's a great thing. And, uh, in fact, we're going to hear from the Reeds. They're going to sing for us. So why don't you come on up, uh, Isaac and Tanya and Emma Jean and Josiah. You don't have Marianne in this mix yet, huh? All right. All right. They're coming. We'll look forward to hearing them sing for us, all right? In the harvest now is ripe and there's a work for all to do. Hark the voice of God is calling to the harvest calling you. Live as much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it, and he'll not forsake his own. Where is much when God is in it? Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it. If you're going Jesus' name, are you laid aside from service, body worn from toil and care? You can still be in the battle, in that sacred place of prayer. Learn much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. When the conflict here is ended and our race on earth is done, he will say, if we are faithful, welcome home, my child, well done. Little and much when God is in it, Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you're going Jesus' name. Let's turn over to 264 in your hymnal. 264. He is able, he is able to deliver thee. You can remain seated. 264 on that first together. Tis the grandest theme through the ages rung. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world has sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Who oh, by sin oppressed go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Let's sing that last together. Tis the grandest thing. Let the tidings roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to God and
Well, I love my church month, and our last testimony of the month is going to be Brett and Lisa Lindke, and uh, they, Lisa, of course, was Lisa Woods, and uh, was our pianist here, and uh, somebody matched her up with this fella from Commonwealth Baptist College in New York State, and uh, they started corresponding, and uh, they started doing more than corresponding, <laughs> and Lord put them together, and he took her down to Kentucky, and uh, they were there for a while, and then up to New York, and then by the, by the hand of God, uh, he led them back here to Bible Baptist Amen. Church, and uh, when when did it was a dinner day? Yeah. Well, two years now. That we came back. Yeah, was it two years? Okay, and uh, that was uh, two years ago, and uh, what a what a blessing they are to our church. Amen. And uh, Brad and Lisa do the bus route, uh, bus captain, and they had twenty one uh, on the bus. Uh, unusual thing, they had eighteen were coming in and had twenty one going home. <laughs> So I don't ask questions. I just say they had 21 on the bus, amen. And uh, <laughs> but it was uh, that's a great day for them, and uh, we thankful for their service and uh, their faithfulness there. And uh, they, of course, Lisa with the music and the pianist, and it's a big load when when you're basically the piano player, uh, and she carries a big load and does a great job. And uh, we appreciate the Linkies. Uh, God just uh, blessed us when He sent them back to us. And uh, we love them, and uh, we're glad they're part of our church family. And we'll hear from them right after we sing our song, all right? The joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh. We're the Linky family and uh, we love Bible Baptist Church. Um, I got saved when I was 17 years old, halfway through my senior year of high school, March 1st, 1997, at the YMCA basement. Uh, there was a special rally. I went to that, and that was the night I got saved. Um, we serve, let's see, we serve on the, uh, in the bus ministry. My wife plays piano. We both serve in choir. Uh, let's see, nursery. Uh, well, you and, well, sometimes I do. Uh, it's true. Well, someone's got to watch our kids. Um, let's see, what else do we do? Uh, substitute teach every once in a while. We also, uh, junior church. That was a blessing today. We did that. Uh, what else? Um, pretty much anything that we can jump in and do. Um, we try to. Um, I don't know how successful we are, but we try. Um, let's see here. Um, why do we love our church? Uh, no, so kidding aside, we, we love Bible Baptist because of one word, opportunity. Um, I told Pastor that, and uh, that you, you'd be surprised how many churches out there will not let you serve. Uh, if you don't have a dollar sign attached to your name, you won't do anything. But here, we don't look at paychecks, we look at the heart. And if you want to serve, you can. There's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of places. Um, you know, everyone's equal here. And it doesn't matter how much you make or if you make anything or nothing. If you want to serve, you got a spot. And uh, I, I'd say that's why I love this church. Is that, um, you know, I think I was forgiven when I brought back the piano player. Uh, we got married in this church and I, I kind of stole the piano player. But I did bring her back. And so I think I was forgiven because I brought her back. But uh, in any case, uh, but we did get married here, and our kids are raised in the nursery and, and Sunday school class, so we're going to get a little older and all. But the biggest thing is that it's always kind of felt like home. And uh, so I, I remember I'd come up to see Lisa, and I'd see the Beulah exit, and I'd start seeing Beulah land. And then I found out later it was a racetrack. So can't have everything. This has always been home um, for me. 
And uh, when we came back, there was still the welcome. There was still the warm mm -hmm. reception. Um, I'd have to say that's one of the biggest reasons that we love Bible Baptist Church. Um, of course, um, we do serve in different aspects, and we try to help, help however we can. Um, that's why we love it. Seventy-five in your hymnal. Seven-five. There's a land that is fairer than day. In the sweet by and by. Let's all stand together one more time as we sing. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore amen greet one another make somebody feel welcome especially our guests we'll come back and sing that last stanza together In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. To our bountiful Father above, He will offer. We will offer our tribute of praise. Let's sing that last stanza together. To our bountiful Father above, we will offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of his love and the blessings that hallow our days. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Amen. Good singing. You may be seated. 
The ushers will come and we'll get our offering now tonight. Give as the Lord has blessed and prospered you. We'll ask the Lord's blessing on our giving here this evening. Brother Andy, lead us in our prayer, please. Lord, we again thank you for the service we can come to and just to sing your praises and lift your name up, Father. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to give back to you what you've given to us so mercifully. I just pray that you would help us to be cheerful givers tonight. And Lord, as we get ready for the preaching of your word, may you prepare our hearts to be spirit-filled listeners tonight and give us understanding, and we'll thank you for it. We'll give you all the praise and glory, for you are worthy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Take your Bibles this evening for our scripture reading to Proverbs 22, if you would please. Proverbs chapter 22. We're going to read the first six, six verses of Proverbs 22. And I'll begin on verse 1, then you join me on 2, and we'll alternate like that, so we'll end together on verse number 6. And, of course, that'll be our text verse for this evening. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the Scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's Word. And let's, I'll begin on verse number 1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. By humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And let's pray. <clears throat> Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture now this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity again to be here on a Sunday evening. Uh, Lord, we've enjoyed the music tonight. It's been a blessing to our soul. I, I trust that it's been a blessing to you as we've uh, sung with melody in our hearts under the Lord this evening. And Father, I pray that you'll continue now to use uh, the special to prepare our hearts that It'll be fertile ground, good ground, that the Word of God will fall into and bring forth fruit in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.
was near to despair when he came to me there and he showed me got to be a blessing to hear that, isn't it? Amen. Talking to the reeds. What a blessing. Amen. Father, we thank you for reaching your hand down to us. Lord, we realize that we weren't seeking you, but you were seeking us. I'm thankful the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, Father, we bow before you as we come to the preaching of your word and I pray you'd help each of us to give our careful attention to the Word of God this evening. Lord, I pray that each of us would, uh, as the Scripture admonishes us, to gird up the loins of our mind, that we would not allow our mind to wander and think about other things and miss what you would want to say to us this evening. And so, Father, I pray you would help each of us to be focused and to give our full attention to the Word of God this evening. And whatever the Spirit of God would speak to our hearts about as we look into your inspired word. So Lord, speak to us and do a work here in our midst that only you can do. And help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Probably one of the best known and least practiced verses in the Bible. <clears throat> you know, we live in a world of spoiled adult children. I think we have one of them running for president, but that's another sermon. But we do live in a country of entitlements. In fact, 85% of the budget of the United States of America is entitlements. We live in a country of laziness and greed and lying and cheating. I never thought I'd see the day when America would have an out-and-out -out socialist run for the highest office in our country and he would be embraced by people. 
There was a day, in case you don't know, there was a day when he would have been laughed at and had no chance of even thinking about running for office. Chuck Colson, who, of course, started prison fellowship and went to heaven several years ago, he said he personally, I think, had been in 130-some prisons and he'd spoken to over 100,000 prisoners. And he said the main cause of the prison population is a lack of moral training in the home. A lack of moral training in the home. So it, it, it brings us to the point that the vast majority of children are not being trained in the way that they should go. The vast majority of children are not being trained the way the Bible says they ought to be trained. For when they grow old, they certainly are not walking with God. They certainly are not pleasing to the Lord. And so, I want us to understand something. You cannot claim the promise of this text if you do not obey the command of the text. In order to get the promise, you have to obey the command. Alright? And I think the text will hit everyone tonight. I think it will hit parents, obviously. But I think it will hit grandparents. It, may, it will hit aunts and uncles. And it will hit teachers. Anybody who has any kind of influence over a child, this will be beneficial to you this evening. Now as we go through the, the message tonight, I want you to remember, I just want you to keep in mind one question and then one statement, alright? The question is this, I want you to just keep in your mind. And that question is, in this matter of rearing children, in this matter of training children, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? In this matter of training children, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? The statement is this, I will always see the faults of other parents more clearly than I see my own. Okay? It is always easier to see the mistakes that other parents are making than it is to see the mistakes that you're making. It is, the, it is exactly what Jesus talked about. In Jesus' terms, it would say, it sure is easier to see the moat in other parents' eye than the beam in your own eye. And so it's, it seems like it's so easy to find fault with others and miss it in our own life. Now let's look at the verse this evening and we're just going to take certain <clears throat> words and a few phrases here and then I'm going to give you some principles that I think are listed here in chapter 22 and that will be our message for this evening. Number one, I want you to circle or underline the word train. Train up a child. Train means to form by instruction and practice. <clears throat> to form by instruction and practice. Do you understand something? Children will not do right on their own. Children will not do right on their own. They'll go astray from the womb. A child left to himself, he would say later in the book of Proverbs, a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. He will bring you to shame if you just let him, oh, just let him make their own choices. No, you're making a big mistake if you do that. That's not the way to train the child. Training is more than teaching. Teaching is part of training, but it doesn't say teach a child in the way they should go. It says train up a child in the way they should go. You form by instruction and practice. So the promise is not to those who teach their children, though that's included in the promise, but the promise is those who train their children. Train up a child in the way that you should go. Now, I think when it comes to training, there's two essentials that you have to have. And number one is charity. Charity. So why do you choose charity? Because, by the way, 1 Corinthians 13 is the charity chapter. I think we do it a, a disservice if we just lower it to the love chapter. You know, God uses love often in the Bible. Love one another. God is love. God so loved the world. Uh, this is uh, this how you, you uh, if you love me, keep my commandments. He used the word love freely all through the Bible. But when he came to 1 Corinthians 13, he purposefully used the word charity. And, and, and there's a reason for that. 
<clears throat> love, as we know from <clears throat> the definition that we've given it through Reformers Unanimous, is the uh, sacrificial, willing, giving of oneself for the benefit of others or the benefit of someone else with no thought of return. I'm going to willfully, sacrificially give of myself for the benefit of somebody else and I'm not thinking about what they're going to do for me. Okay? That is, that is if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. If he's naked, clothe him. Put some clothes on him. In other words, I'm going to willingly, sacrificially give of myself to meet their need and I'm not expecting anything in return. That's love. That's love. But charity, charity is love, but charity goes beyond that. See, charity, and especially when you look at 1 Corinthians 13, charity has the idea with it that not only am I going to willfully and sacrificially do what's best for the other person and try to meet their need, but I want the best for them. Charity has the feelings that go with it that I, I'm doing it because I really want the best for you. I think the best, I desire the best, I want the best, I, I, I want you to succeed, I want you to make it. Listen, I can feed somebody or close somebody or, or give somebody something to drink and not really like them. That's why Jesus said you can do that to your enemies. Okay? And He never said you're going to like everybody. But He did say you're supposed to love everybody. So charity, though, goes beyond that, and it does mean you have feelings. And obviously with your children, you not only, listen, want to willingly and sacrificially give to help them and meet their needs, but you want to do it, and you want to want what's best for them. There's not a parent alive that doesn't want the best for their children. I shouldn't say they're not a parent alive, because there are some parents that shouldn't be parents. Uh, and I'm not sure they do want the best for their children. Uh, but there, certainly if you're a God-fearing parent, you would want the best for your being. You have those feelings of wanting them to succeed, wanting what's best for them. Charity, that's why charity means kindness, and charity means patience, and charity means tenderness. Charity means affection. Love and charity will reach the heart of your child. That's why it's essential. The first essential in training them is charity. Because give me, throughout Proverbs, you'll find him, him pleading with his son, give me thine heart. That's what you have to have. God didn't, when, when God saved us, he saved us when we believed in our heart. God said the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. It's not just, not just a rule book that we follow the rules. God says, I want your heart. I want your heart to be in it. And so the Lord wants this. Listen, we're, we are always more easily led than we are pushed. Okay? Aren't you that way? And children are that way too. We're much more easily led than pushed. The, when, when, when the greatest commandment, Jesus said, they asked him what the greatest commandment was, and he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. In fact, it's in, uh, it's in Matthew, isn't it? Oh, is it Matthew 22? Does that sound right? I want to say 22, like 36 or 37. Yes, Matthew 22. Look at verse number 36. The lawyer came to him and tempted him, asking him a question. Verse 36, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second's like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So what's the greatest commandment? To love God, right? What's the second greatest one? Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't miss the next verse. He said, on these two commandments, loving God, loving your neighbor, hang all the law and the prophets. Love came before the law came. God laid down the law in, in the, the, the Ten Commandments in uh, Exodus chapter 20. There's 50 chapters of Genesis and 19 chapters of Exodus that God, God took that much time to establish with Israel the fact He loved them. And because I love you, I'm laying down the law. And people will always accept the law when they know that you love them. 
When you try to lay down the law to somebody and they don't know that you love them, you'll get rebellion every time. Because they don't know you. And so it's important and essential, first of all, that your children know that you love them. That you love them with all your heart. You have to establish that charity. Not just that you'll willingly and sacrificially give and and meet their need and, and give for their benefit, but the fact that you desire the best for them. And you're for them. And you're with them. And you're tender-hearted to them. And you're kind to them. And you're patient with them. And that's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, charity never, what? Fails. Never fails. Man, if, something, if I know something that never fails, works every time, why wouldn't I use it? Absolutely we should. And so the first thing is charity. Now the second thing is correction. Correction. The second essential in training is correction. Having great love and charity for your child cannot blind you to their faults. After all, they are your children. They came from you. Okay? And so... Punishment, listen, punishment and correction are very disagreeable things. I, I you know, I, I remember the speech that I would hear when I was a kid from my dad. On the, on the rare occasion, you understand that I would have to be disciplined. That, that thank you, Brother French, I appreciate that. And... He would say, now, son, this hurts me. Oh, you that must have been a speech parents learned in those days, huh? And, you know, obviously as a kid, you don't get that. You think, hey, you're not on my end of things, you know? But you understand, I, I did understand that once I became a parent. It was, it was, it was as difficult on me to spank our children as it was on them, I'm sure. And, and I know it wasn't pleasant for them. But it was difficult for me. If, if you enjoy having to administer a spanking or discipline to your children, you need to get your heart checked. You, you've got some issues. However, it, doesn't, it, it is something that must be done. Notice Hebrews 12 and verse number 6. The Bible says, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. It says, every son that God's ever received, he's disciplined. He's had to punish. How many of you have been in this room, been saved for a year or more? Let me see your hand. That's most everybody. How many of you, how many of you, have, ever been, how many of you have ever been taken to God's woodshed and he's let you have it? Absolutely. See? That's, a, that's not a bad sign. That's a sign you're his child and he loves you. Okay? And, and he wants uh, to, to help you. And so he chastens every son whom he receiveth. Now, the Bible's clear. Go back to the book of Proverbs, would you please? Where we're going to look at. Uh, j- just, I would just want you to jot some verses down and uh, look at them with me and, and mark them down on your paper if you're taking some notes. Because these are verses that deal with correction of children disciplining of children. It is proper and it's right to discipline our, ch- our children. Now, let me make sure we understand this and, and, and there's a whole uh, message we go through and we'll, we'll, we illustrate the proper way to give a spanking to a child. It's never right to go up and just hit a child. We're not talking about any kind of abuse. We're not talking about just in your anger and in your ups- being upset, you just haul off and, and whack a kid. Uh, grabbing a kid by his arm and lifting him up and going across the room trying to hit him on the bottom while he's squirming, that's not a spanking. That's your frustration at your child and you're taking it out on him. Okay? So, I understand there's a, there's a proper way to administer discipline. Okay? You just be the adult and not the kid. Okay? And you be in charge. The Bible says in Proverbs 13 and verse number 24, the Bible says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Again, chasteneth means to correct by punishment. Again, it is betimes simply means 
in a good season or before it's too late. You, you can wait till it's too late. And you, you'll, listen, if you don't get control of that four-year-old, you're not going to get control of the 14-year-old. You, you, didn't, you, didn't lose the, 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 you didn't lose the child when they became 14 or 15. You lost them when they were four or five and you didn't make them mind you. That's where you lost it. And so you chasten them and, and you correct them uh, while you can and before it's too late. Now look at Proverbs 19 and verse 18. Proverbs 19 and verse 18. Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Every child who's ever lived has thought if they could scream bloody murder, they'll, you'll stop. And you tried it too probably when you were a kid. Okay? And, and listen, you, you, you administered in the proper way where the Lord gave them the padding, okay? And uh, gave them the, the target area, all right? Then uh, you minister the discipline in the proper way. Uh, God says you, you chasten them again while there's hope and, and you, you administer and you don't be concerned about their crying. Tears are, tears are not bad. Tears are okay. They're good. Okay? And so don't, don't be fearful of that. Chapter 22, the chapter we're in tonight, look down at verse number 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of the child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Say, so what? Listen, you know, you know what the most, some of the most wasted words in English language are? Is when you look at a child and say, why did you do that? You know why they did that? Foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. And, and, and it's there. We're, they're they're going to do wrong. They have a sin nature. And so they're going to do wrong. You know why they did it? Because they're sinners. Okay? And so you're going to help them. What drives that foolishness out? The rod of correction. Okay? The, 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 when they... Listen, the goal of all discipline is for the child to self-discipline. The goal of discipline is that if you lay down, whether they're young and they know that I don't want the pain inflicted where my padding is, and so I'm not going to do this, or you, you, when they go to do something, you say, nah, you want to spank it? And they say, see, you know what they did? They, they just reminded them, I don't want, the, 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 the punishment is not worth the pleasure of doing this. Okay? And that's what you do as you get older. When, when I got older, if I, would, if I missed my curfew and my father said, okay, you don't go out for two weeks, anytime I'm out then and I decide, well, it's getting, getting to be where I better start heading home, I have to think, now do I want to stay and give up two weeks worth of going out? Or do I want to get home? You know what I mean? So his discipline led me to self-discipline. And I got myself home. Because I, I disciplined myself to do that so that I wouldn't violate his discipline. And that's the goal, Mom and Dad. The goal isn't for you to work out your frustrations. The goal isn't for you to get satisfaction. It's for their benefit. And then you'll begin to see them make the right choices. Over in Proverbs 23, verse number 13. Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. That goes back to don't let your soul spare for his crying. He'll cry like they're dying. Okay? They're not dying. All right? And so you, you don't worry about that, but you don't withhold correction. For thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Listen, more children are going, are going to end up going the wrong way and going to hell through lack of discipline than any are through discipline. Okay? Uh, <laughs> how many of you grew up in a home where your, your, your parents spanked you when you did something majorly wrong? You, got, you, you were spanking offenses. All right? Most of the people in the room. Okay? Now let me ask you a question. How many of you feel like you really got some spankings that you never deserved? Okay? <laughs> got one over here. Who else? I think you got something you didn't deserve. Two, three, four. Okay. All right. 
How many of you know that you didn't get some that you should have deserved? Look at that. I think parents are still on the, on the, you know, the upside of things, don't you think? And, and, and so we, we needed those. That didn't hurt us. That helped us. And when America decided, you know, that they're going to follow Spock instead of the Bible... And they're gonna they're gonna get rid of God and get rid of the Bible and get rid of prayer and don't and 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 substitute sports on weekends instead of church on weekends. Uh, how's that working for us? How's that doing, America? What kind of children are we are we bring are we turning out with that? Withhold not correction. And then in Proverbs twenty nine, and verse number seventeen, Proverbs twenty nine and verse seventeen, correct thy son. And he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Now, now, listen carefully. When you say, oh, these kids, man, I just got to have a break. They're driving me up the wall. I don't know what to do. I got to have some time off. You know what that means? You're, you do not have control of them. They have control of you. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Okay? Undisciplined children don't give you any rest. Can I Listen, that means when you say the child, it's time for the nap, they lay down and they take a nap. They, they, you, you, and, and by the way, they say, well, they just get up out of bed. They wouldn't do it too often. The, the, the punishment would be greater than they can bear. And they'll be glad to lay in bed. Okay? They won't want to get up. And, and you, again, you have to, and that's training. What's training? Remember, formation by practice. You just keep doing it. And by the way, training, listen, mom and dad, training's always taking place. You're either training them or they're training you. But it's always taking place. Uh, several weeks ago, you remember me mentioning the young couple at Reformers Unanimous, and I noticed she was in Reformers Unanimous and her husband wasn't. I said, where's, where's Charles? And she goes, oh, he's down with such and such, their little two-year-old. And he was sitting down in the lobby with her and her sitting in his lap. And I said, man, you need to be at RU. Put her in the nursery. That's what we have a nursery for. Oh, she cries. She cries when we put her in the nursery. I said, so? Put her in the nursery anyway. I said, you know what she's doing? She's learned that if I cry and I fuss, I get to sit on Daddy's lap the whole night. And I don't have to go in here. I said, see, she just trained you. You didn't train her. Now, to their credit, they put her in there. And she cried. Of course, Mrs. Barham was in there probably, but uh, no, I'm kidding. But you know what? After they're in there a little bit, they're fine. You see? You, you, but it's a matter of who's in charge. Is it going to be the two-year-old or is it going to be the adult? Is it going to be mom or dad? Training takes place. Okay? When you let the child get up when they go to bed, you let them get out of bed, they're training you is what they're trying to do. To let them go to bed when they want to go to bed. Let them do what they want to do. You say, you're not here to do what you want to do. You're here to do what we say to do. We were here before you. And we run this house. Okay? And we love you, but it's bedtime. Don't get up. Okay? You get up, that will be direct disobedience to daddy, and you'll get a spanking. Pretty simple. Not yelling, not screaming. By the way, when you have to yell and scream, you've lost your authority. Okay? You, you go to court, you get to, pulled over by a police officer, they don't yell and scream at you. You know why? They have the authority. So they don't have to yell and scream. When you yell and scream at your children, you've lost your authority. I can tell that's popular, okay? <clears throat> See, Dad and Mom, the Bible's clear. You represent God in the home. And so you have to represent God in the home. And so you can't overlook wrong. In other words, their, their minds, and you're forming their mind, and listen, in their mind, they're going to believe God's just like you. 
And if you overlook wrong and you overlook and let them do what they want, they think God's that way too. And by the way, but if you're overbearing and you're harsh and you're unloving and you don't have charity, they're going to think God's that way too. And you'll shape their view of God. And so it's very, it's very clear. Train them. The Bible says train up the child. It doesn't say consult the child. It doesn't say that you're to cater to the child. It doesn't say you're to humor the child. It doesn't even say you're supposed to please the child. It just says train up the child. I'm not so concerned. Listen, I'm not so concerned. I never was real concerned that my kids liked me when they were growing up. Okay? I, I, I grew up with my dad. I, <clears throat> I, I mean, we, we had fun. We played ball. We did stuff. But, but I'll tell you what, when, when I crossed him, I was afraid of him. Even when I got to be as big as he was. I always had that, 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 that healthy fear of dad. And, and that doesn't mean he wasn't my friend. He was. But, but I, listen, he, he brought me up not to like him then, but to like him later. If you have little children at home, your goal isn't for them just like you now. Let them, let them 25 years from now come back and say, boy, dad, I really like you. Thank you for how you brought me up. Thank you for what you did for me. All right, so that's train. Number two is the word child back in Proverbs 22. Uh, train up a child. A child. It's interesting, the word used for child here is a word that means from infancy to adolescence. Infancy to adolescence. It means that training begins the moment the child enters your home. Training begins the moment that they enter the home. And by the way, they begin to learn the language of mom and dad. Drew is that age now where he'll repeat, he'll repeat words, you say. Okay? And uh, he, he repeats, and, and they'll repeat words without thinking. They repeat it just because they heard you say it. And so they'll, they'll think, that, that, they'll say that. It was cute the other night. They were, my wife was, uh, I think they were coloring, and he pulled a color out, and he would always say, what color is this? You know, green and yellow and blue, and, and um, you color was it you pulled out and you told what it was blue blue it says there's blue and and drew says no i think it's black <laughs> where'd that come from a whole sentence no i think it's black thought wow and he 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 can say things and he has manner out of the way they pick up your mannerisms and and you'll see it uh sometimes and by the way sometimes you think something's okay to you see your child doing it and you think, is that what I look like when I do that? Is that what I sound like when I say that? And boy, it'll, it'll bring you back to reality pretty quick. They, 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 their, their minds are like soft clay, like we talked about this morning. And you're making those impressions in their mind. And boy, once you make those impressions, you can't undo them. And so don't neglect it. You only have one opportunity to make the impression. Don't mess it up. Don't neglect it. Take it seriously. Once it's gone, it's gone forever. So we train up a child, and then the next phrase, in the way that he should go. The way that he should go. It doesn't say the way they want to go, but the way they ought to go. That he should go. And I believe the way they should go is the way of God. I believe the way they should go is the way of the Bible. I believe the way they should go is the way of salvation, the way of grace, the way of pleasing God. And listen, but parents, the way they should go is the way we must go. Okay? Uh, you're not going to... They're not going to go in the way you say. They're going to go in the way you go. <clears throat> Jesus lived as our example. 1 Peter 2 says that we should follow His steps. As our example. Did he, did he teach? Yes, He did. But He lived it. And so he lived so we could follow his example. It's not going to do you any good, parent, to say, now listen, you do as I say, not as I do. That's a waste of your breath right there. Children learn more by the eye than they do with the ear. And they will not practice what they do not see in you. 
They may not understand your lectures. They may not understand your commands. They may not understand your advice. But they will understand your life. So the way they should go is the way you should go also. Number four. The fourth phrase is when they're old, they will not depart from it. There's the promise. It doesn't say that they'll leave it and come back to it. Just the other day I heard somebody say who had a, had a wayward son, a prodigal if you will, that left home and they said, but you know, I'm claiming that verse that, you know, when train them up in the way they should go, when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Listen, God may have your prodigal come home like he did the prodigal in Luke 15. But it's not because of Proverbs 22.6. It's because of God's mercy and God's grace. Proverbs 22.6 says that when you train up a child in the way he should go, when he's old, and the word old there, by the way, is aged. It's used for Abraham and Sarah, who were 190, respectively. Okay? And, and I don't care where you are, that's old. Okay? And, and not, in other words, they'll, they'll, they'll not depart from it, they'll not move from it. So the promise is they won't depart at all. They'll stay with it. That's the promise. What a promise that is. Now, the command is not easy. And I don't know, listen, and I don't know any parent who who has children that have stayed in the way of God and continue to serve the Lord and, and are faithfully in church on Sunday and serving God with their life that parents take the credit for that. Almost any parent I've ever come across that has children that are grown and serving God, they don't say, yeah, we did did all the right things. No, you know what I usually hear? By the grace of God, they're serving the Lord. In spite of, they always say, in spite of what we did. I mean, really it is. Now, listen, by the way, it always is by the grace of God. It's always by His sufficiency, not our sufficiency. But you have to act, listen, you can't train them up in the way they should go without the help of God. It's impossible. The arm of flesh will fail you. And, and you say, well, and, and by the way, we, are, we all are hypocrites. All of us at times talk it better than we walk it. Especially at home. We all have moments when we get in the flesh. We don't respond the way we should with something or we don't do something the way we ought to or we, we punish in anger. But, the, but, the, but the, listen, the real key, mom and dad, is what do you do when that happens? You know what's amazing to me is how many, how many children that I talk to, teenagers, who will say, I've never heard my dad say he's sorry. I've never heard my dad say, forgive me. Of course, Donald Trump's children haven't, but um, that's another story. Isn't that sad? Hey, you know what? Someone's not going to live in your home for 18 years and you never do anything wrong. There's times you're going to have to come to your children and say, you know what, I'm sorry. I was wrong. I need to ask you to forgive me. I didn't handle that right, or I didn't treat you right, or I didn't say that right. I, I, I was wrong. It's okay. They, they, they will have more respect for you than if you deny that you ever do anything wrong. So when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Train them in the way they should go. And they'll remain in that way. And if you train them the opposite, if you train them in the way they should not go, they're going to remain in that way. Where they ought not to go. If you train them in the way they shall go, they'll end up where they should be. Now, let me just briefly give you four principles. I think there's four. Four principles here in, in chapter 22. I don't, I don't think chapter 22, verse 6, is just like an island all by itself. I think there's principles all through here about training up a child in the way they should go. 
And let me just give you four of them tonight quickly and we'll be done. All right? Number one is verse one. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Here's an important principle to teach your child. Who you are is more important than what you have. Who you are is more important than what you have. A good name is rather to be chosen. Now he didn't say a famous name. He said a good name. A good name's your character. Someone said you don't, you don't make up a good name you hammer and chisel it out on your own. And you do. It's your character. It's your integrity. Teach your children that who you are, your honesty, your integrity, your character is more important than what you have. You think, you think honesty and character and integrity is more important than money? Yeah. Yeah. Ask Tiger Woods if he thinks that's true. Ask Hillary Clinton if she thinks that's true. Hmm? Ask, ask some of the people who, listen, who have all kinds of money, but they don't have any, they don't have a good name. Hmm? And a good name. You, you've heard me say how many times when I was in high school and I'd, uh, leave to go to a ball game or leave to uh, go out with folks from high school. My dad always say, remember who you are. And what he meant was that I, I, he, he lived, my grandfather, my grandfather lived in that area. My dad lived and worked in, in that area. And he said, we've worked to make that name mean something. Don't you mess it up. A good name is rather be chosen. So what you are is more important than what you have. Number two, the second principle you can teach them is verse 2. The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. Uh, teach them this. You're no better than anybody else. You're no better than anybody else. The rich and the poor are both made by who? God. We're all God's creatures. We're not all God's children. You're the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. If you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're not God's child. Okay, You're God's creature, but you're not God's child. Now we're alike in our infirmities, we're alike in our human nature, we're alike in our sins, we're alike in our judgment, we're alike in the salvation that God offers to us. But we're not all born equal. Some are born with spina bifida. Some are born with cerebral palsy. Some are born with diabetes. Some are born in palaces. Some are born in poverty. Some are born into Bible-believing homes with Christian parents. And some are born into atheistic homes and godless homes. We're not born equal, but the Lord is the maker of us all. The Lord, the Lord made a David, but He made a Mephibosheth. The Lord, made, the Lord made Dr. Luke, but He also made blind Bartimaeus. So, God made us different, but He made us all. You see, we get, a, we get away from the truth of the book. We get away from the truth of the Bible, and that's where you get all these black lives matter. And this life matters. And this color life matters. Hey, the Bible says all lives matter. And by the way, that includes the, live, the lives that are in the womb. How about, how about unborn lives matter? Where's, where's that group? See? Listen, because we gotten away from the Bible. We have no value of, of what life all, is all about. Nobody's better than anybody else. I like what Dr. Ben Carson said in one of the debates when he said, you know, it doesn't matter what the color of the person is on the table, when I cut their head open to look in their brain, it's all the same. It's all the same. And he's right. So make sure that you don't... You don't have to look, you don't look down on anybody else. And by the way, you don't have to look up to anybody else. Everybody, God created us all. And so, no, you're no better than anybody else. Number three, verse number three. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. The third principle you teach your, your children are stay far, far away from evil. Stay far, far away from evil. Prudent means that is the cautious one, the circumspect one, 
The one who sees the evil, who looks ahead and hides himself. He sees the evil and gets away from it. Doesn't want to see how close he can get to it. It's, it's what Paul wrote to the church of Corinth when he said, you flee fornication. He told Timothy, flee youthful lusts. Run away. Get out of there. Like Joseph did when Potiphar's wife made the advance. He just left his, he just ran. Get me out of here. That's what you do when, when evil comes. And if you, listen young people, children, if you can't see the evil, listen to someone who can. How many times you, a child said, well, I don't see what's so wrong. Well, if your mom and dad see what's wrong, listen to your mother and father. Why did God give you parents if you already know it all? Why did God give you authorities if you can do your own thing and you don't need anybody to tell you what to do? God gave you parents for a reason. And they're to help you see the evil and hide yourself. And by the way, there's only one hiding place. That's Jesus Christ. Uh, Our life is hid with Christ in God. You hide in Him. And He keeps you from the evil. He keeps you from the evil one. He's the only one who can. Greater is He that's in us than he that's in the world and so I'm going to hide in Christ and I'm going to let him deal with the evil one safe from harm safe from evil and you stay as far away from that as you can you know we visited the Grand Canyon years ago and you know it's amazing to me that every year I I think on an average every year half a dozen people fall in and kill themselves I I, you know, and they have railings. They have a railing there before you get to the edge. It's, it's back about this far, and, and so you can sit there. You can still see down. I never had any desire to kind of, you know, get under there and get out here to the edge. And I had no desire to do that. I want to stay as far away from that edge as I can. You know why? I'll fall in, man. That's why. I don't have any desire to fall over the cliff, Okay. But why is it that people want to get as close as they can to sin without sinning? And boy, one misstep, one slip, and you're gone. Don't, don't, don't draw the line right there. Draw it back. I remember a college president telling the story one time of a young couple that came to his class at the college I went to there was no physical contact at all between the men and the women. No hand-holding, no touching, no nothing. And so the couple came to the pastor and was very downcast, and he tried to get from them, what's, what's the problem? And they said, we've sinned. And, and he was so brokenhearted. He said, well, listen, I, I want to help you. Uh, tell me, you got to tell me what you did, and, and we'll, we'll see what we can go do from here. And well, you're thinking I'm going to have to expel them or what's going to happen? And he said, why don't you tell me what you did? And they confessed that when they were in the dating parlor, they held hands with each other. And in his heart, he went, Phew. <laughs> That's all it was. But you know why? They set the standard far enough away from the evil. See? That they, they slipped up, they messed up, they broke the rule. And they'd have to be punished, but that's the worst it was. See, if all you say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this and do that and do this, I'll do everything but that, you're going to do that. You know why? Because you didn't draw the line far, far from evil. You left it too close to the edge. Bob Reed always says you, you, don't, put, you don't put temptation and opportunity in the same room together. That means you keep far, far away from evil, all right? And I don't know, I attribute that to you. I don't know if that's original. Yeah, that that came from Dad, huh? (laughs) Okay? And uh, that's Tom Reed, I guess, okay? And uh, so let's do that. Let's do number four and we're done, all right? Number four, this is verse four. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Number four, here's the fourth principle. God sees in secret and rewards openly. God sees in secret and rewards openly. Get the inside right and the outside's going to follow. 
Get the inside right and the outside's going to follow. Humility and fear of the Lord. You know, the only one who knows whether you're truly humble and whether you truly fear the Lord is God. The only one who knows that. And God says, I'll see in secret and I can reward you openly. Only God's going to know if I possess those qualities. And God says, when you do that, I'm going to reward you. Notice what He says. Riches, honor, and life. Life is the word there we use for the word health. So God says, I'm going to give you riches, I'm going to give you honor, and I'm going to give you health. Well, everybody can see those. That's outwardly. God says, I'll, I'll watch what you are in secret and I'll reward you openly. Isn't that what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount? When it comes to giving alms and praying and fasting, that your Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Teach your children, God always sees you. Teach your children, God is concerned what's going on on the inside. When I was younger growing up, I remember watching a show called Captain Penny. Anybody watch Captain Penny? Nobody? Oh, wow. I was northeastern Ohio. Captain Penny used to come on at noon. I used to have lunch, watch Captain Penny, and then take a nap. And Captain Penny would always say at the end of his show, he says, remember, you can fool some of the people all the time, all the people some of the time, but you can't fool mom. So I always said to all these kids, well, I'm, I'm sitting there, you know, I'm a little five-year-old. Can't fool mom. Huh? Hey, hey, how many of you believe what he said is true? Huh? Yeah, yeah, all the moms do. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Kids, don't listen. Yeah. No, the truth is, you know what? Uh, kids are going to be able to fool you. Kids can fool others. Bob gave his testimony. For years, you tried to fool everybody that he was saved when he wasn't saved. He's leading music, church, not saved, but fooling people. Hmm? But you know, you couldn't. You know who he couldn't fool? Couldn't fool God. And God, God forced that thing in his life. You ever hear his testimony? You ought to, you ought to have him share it with you. God, God, God forced that thing where he had to know that. I've got to do something about this. And listen, there, there are things now that sometimes when you get together, even our kids will talk about, and they'll say something, and, and my wife and I will look at each other and say, we never knew about that. You did that? Huh? We just found out they figured the statute of limitations is up, so they can't get in trouble now, you know. But what happened? They fooled us. We had no idea. And you've done the same things. But you can't fool God. There'll come a time when they're out, and listen, we won't be there to see you. No one will be there to watch you. But God sees you. God's watching you. You can fool us and say you read your Bible. You can fool us and say you prayed. But you know what? God knows. God knows. God sees in secret. He rewards you openly. You get... You get what you want by being what you ought to be. You get what you want by being what you ought to be. God rewards you openly for what you are privately. Those are some principles that just here in Proverbs 22 that I think if we train up a child in the way that he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let's pray. Father, take the truth out this evening and these principles that we've looked at tonight from the book of Proverbs. Thank you, Lord, for penning these words for us and for the wisdom you gave Solomon. And Father, I pray that you'd help the parents, the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, the teachers that are in this room, those who have any influence over some children to have some input in the way they ought to go. But Lord, you'd help us to follow the biblical admonition. Oh, help us to keep the command that we could claim the promise. Give us another generation to grow up and to love you, to serve you, to live their lives to be pleasing in your sight. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.
I'll finish the prayer in just a moment, and then we'll have our invitation. I wonder how many folks here tonight would say, Preacher, the Lord has spoken to my heart. I, whether it's your children, whether it's your grandchildren, whether it's children you teach, children you have influence, maybe it's just some principles here tonight that don't just apply to children, they apply to all of us. But you would say the Holy Spirit of God has spoke to my heart tonight, Preacher. And I've got some decisions to make, and I, I want to respond to God this evening in the right way. Pastor, pray for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up tonight and say, Preacher, pray for me. Amen. 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 God bless you. You may put them down. If you're here tonight and you've never received Christ as your Savior, when I'm through praying, we'll stand to our feet, the pianist will play, and Bob will sing. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, then while others come to pray, would you slip from your seat and come down here to the front? Let someone take a Bible and show you how you can know you're on your way to heaven when you die. If you're not, you're saved and you've ever been scripturally baptized, you ought to come and say, Preacher, I need to be baptized. If you're tonight, you're saved and you're scripturally baptized and you believe this is where you ought to belong, then you ought to come and say, I, I want to belong here. I want to serve God here at Bible Baptist Church. We'd welcome you into our fellowship. Whatever it is that God's dealt with your heart about tonight, respond to Him. Heavenly Father, bless this invitation. May Your will be done in each heart and life. Thank You for speaking to our hearts this evening through Your Word. I pray holy decisions will be made for Thee this evening that will affect our homes and affect our children. It will make them to be able to bring them up in the way they ought to go. That they will not depart from it even when they're aging. So, Father, you have your will and way now in each heart and life, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing, the Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening. Will you please? Oh, to Jesus I surrender All to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live i surrender all i surrender all all to thee my blessed savior i surrender all all to jesus i surrender at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. I surrender. I surrender all. Go ahead and be seated for a minute, if you would, please. And uh, get the names here of Isaac and Josiah. Isaac Reed and Josiah Reed. And uh, Isaac was saved a couple years ago, I think, wasn't it, Bob? Yep. And uh, out in the Children's Church. And Isaac is going to follow the Lord in baptism this evening. And uh, that's a, a good thing for him. And then Josiah. Uh, Josiah just got saved. Did you find that? I thought it was just a couple weeks ago. Do you, what, wasn't it? Just a couple weeks ago. And uh, called mom and into her room and wanted to pray and ask Christ to be his Savior. So that's exciting. So we're going to baptize the brothers.
together tonight, all right? So uh, you head on down. Uh, do you want to go down with them, Bob, or what do you want to do? Uh, whatever you want me to do. Well, I, I, somebody ought to go down and help them get ready. Do you, you want your mom to do it? Okay, all right. Mom can do it. Follow her, and Wallace is down there, and we'll get him ready for baptism. All right, that's wonderful. All right, Brother Bob. Well, let's sing some favorites this evening. We have one hand. Yes, ma'am. 341. 341. All right. We'll sing a couple favorites as we get ready. Victory in Jesus. Let's sing that first together. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory Of his precious blood's atoning And I repented of my sin And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior forever He sought me and he bought me So with his redeeming blood Praise God, he loved me yeah. I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Brother Andy, number 12. <clears throat> he touched me shackled by a heavy burden neath a load of guilt and shame. Let's sing that first. Shackled by a heavy burden, neath a look and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. my soul something happened and now I know he touched me and made me whole Emma 321 321 sound the battle cry See the foe is nigh, raise the standard high for the Lord. Three, two, one. <clears throat> Sound the battle cry, see the foe is nigh, raise the standard high for the Lord. Gird your armor on, stand firm, everyone. Rest your cause upon his holy word. Rousing soldiers. Three forty five. Three four five. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Three four five. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a prayer to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not 
that caring everything to God in prayer. Gabrielle? 337. 337, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Oh, and we walk with the Lord in the light of his word. What a glory he shed on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey, trust and This is Isaac Reed. Isaac, upon a public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, bearing the likeness of Jesus' death and raising the likeness of his life. This is Josiah Reed. <laughs> Josiah, upon a public profession of your faith in Jesus as your Savior, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, bearing the likeness of Jesus' death, and raise the likeness of his name. servant said, Master, it has done as house commanded, and yet there is room. Amen. All right, let's do a couple more. Emma? 102. 102. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes. Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Let's sing the next two verses. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gates to open wide. He will wash away my sin, let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. All right, now when we sing this third verse, we're going to all sing the third together. When we get to the chorus, I'm going to have all the adults drop out. All right? Let's, uh, everybody, uh, let's say, 
15 and under. Sing uh, that chorus, all right? Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. Has bled and died for me, I will henceforth sing. Sing it now. Good. Amen. All right. Well, let's all stand. That's great. Let's stand. We'll close in prayer and have our song of dismissal. All right. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful day. Lord, we're just so grateful for all you're doing here in this place. God, we thank you for the decisions that were, have been made. We thank you for the messages that have been brought. Lord, in the hearts that have been changed, God, I pray that as we leave this place, we would not soon forget uh, your precious word. I uh, pray that uh, you would give us safety on our way home and help us to uh, continue to glorify you through the remainder of the uh, evening and the remainder of the week. In Jesus' precious name I do pray, amen. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus. Anywhere and everywhere I go for. It's a grand thing to be a soldier in this army here below. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. If you haven't gotten your pictures taken yet, families, go on over to the Fellowship Hall. Lindy's over there to take your pictures. You are dismissed.